Thank you for joining us today. My name is Emily Greenstein and I'm a certified wound and ostomy nurse practitioner at Sanford Health in Fargo, North Dakota. Today I'm going to talk to you about diabetes and the impact it has on wound care today. So this is just some important information to remember that all photographs in here are my own, um, that the use of any of the systems is to be done under a treating physician or provider, and that everything I will talk about today is um, my own opinion and will be uh, nothing off label will be presented. So disclosures, um, I am a consultant for KCI, which is now part of 3M. So first of all, let's start off by just looking at some statistics. We all know that diabetes is a huge problem in this country and it's becoming a even bigger problem worldwide. It's projected that 366 million people by the year of 2030 will be impacted by diabetes. These people are at high risk for complications, including the development of foot ulcers. Foot ulcers are affecting about 20% of all diabetics. The even more scary statistic is that once an ulcer develops, there is an incredibly high increased risk for amputation. As a matter of fact, about 85% of all cases that end in amputation first have an ulcer that precedes it. So looking at that, foot ulcers affect about 1.5 million people a year. So now let's look at the pathophysiology of a diabetic foot ulcer. How do these ulcers form? You don't just wake up one day and have an ulcer on your foot. So more than 60% of diabetic foot ulcers are a result of peripheral neuropathy. There is also ischemia from the peripheral vascular disease. So what happens is these patients may lose sensation in their feet. Um, there might be some structural changes that are a result of the um, diabetes also, which results in internal pressure causing these ulcerations as well as external pressure from their footwear. When we look at neuropathy and we look at the pathophysiology behind neuropathy, it is a huge spectrum that's completely connected. We have a patient who's in a hyperglycemic state, so their blood sugar is really high. This leads to increased aldose reductase sorbitol degenerates, which then in turn leads to an increase in intracellular glucose. Once that intracellular glucose is increased, it leads to sorbitol and fructose getting metabolized and into the synthesis of nerve cells. So what happens is that high sugar starts to break down that normal neuron conductivity, which leads to an increase in oxidative stress. Once you have an increase of oxidative stress, that leads to vasoconstriction, loss of sensation, autonomic neuropathy, and all of those things can lead to the development of an ulcer. So next, when we talk about the diabetic foot ulcer, we need to look at infection. So patients who have diabetic foot ulcers are at a higher risk for the development of an infection because of the unique anatomy of their foot. An infection may result from a simple puncture wound from a neuropathic ulcer, from the nail plate, or from the interdigital web space. So when we look at patients who have diabetes, um, thinking that they might have that microvascular blood flow problems, they are at high risk for a small problem turning into a large problem really fast. We also got to look at the microbiology and that is usually dependent on the patient's environment and the severity of the infection itself. So looking at, are, can this patient be treated as an outpatient setting or do they need to be hospitalized and given um, IV antibiotics? We also need to look at, is the infection mild or a superficial ulcer? Is it pretty contained to the local area? Those types of ulcers are usually infected with aerobic or gram-positive cocci. Uh, when we look at the deeper or limb-threatening ulcers in diabetics, so many of you may have heard of, um, say, necrotizing fasciitis, those are usually polymicrobial 
and they can be gram positive and gram negative. The most common cause of um, necrotizing fasciitis in the diabetic foot is strep B. Next one, we talk about ischemia. So in patients who have diabetes, they are at high risk for the microvascular and macrovascular problems. So there's non-occlusive microcirculation impairment, which occurs. Because if you go back to that slide, if you remember, their high glucose levels are damaging the cells, resulting in high oxidative stress, resulting in ischemia. There's a macroangiopathy, which is the larger vessels. So they may have um, blocked vessels in the largers. So looking at your femorals or your popliteal arteries, all the way down to the microvascular ones. So we wanna look at capillary blood flow and the response to stimuli when we're doing an assessment. We want to do a thorough uh, vascular assessment on all of our diabetic patients also. And like I talked about before, these patients are at high risk for atherosclerosis, predominantly of the tibial area. So when you're looking at doing a um, vascular assessment on this patient, it is important to get ABIs, but it's also important to get a test called an arterial duplex. So the arterial duplex study is actually going to show us which vessels are blocked. And it's also going to show us the waveforms so meaning when we look at these tests, a lot of times patients with diabetes will have on an ABI something that says non-compressible vessels, but at the same time, it'll have a waveform that says monophasic, biphasic, or triphasic. Uh, what we're looking for is patients who have that um, monophasic or biphasic blood flow, they need some type of intervention done. So doing an arterial duplex will show us exactly which vessels are diseased. So I'm just going to go through a couple of cases now. So this is a case of a patient who had vascular compromise. He was a male, he's 61 years old. He had uh, type 1 diabetes. He was insulin dependent. His last A1C was 9.7. Um, he said that the wound started as a burn secondary to uh, fireworks. He was um, messing around out on the 4th of July. As you can see, he came in on day zero. The ulceration was there. Day 15, it was um, starting to get ischemic. So he has um, dried eschar on there. He did get revascularized uh, at this point. And then on day 25, it was still... Um, intact eschar on day 30, he ended up getting the toe amputated and it did go on to healing. So like I had talked about the importance of a vascular assessment, making sure you're getting that ABI done. This is an example of a patient who has diabetes. He had an ABI done. The vessels were considered non-compressible. But as you can see, if you look in the report, it says non-compressible with biphasic waveforms, uh, meaning that the blood flow is impaired down to the foot at some point. So then this is a little bit hard to see, but you can see then we went on to order the arterial duplex and the arterial duplex does show the patient has uh, tibial disease um, that the blood flow was compromised. He ended up getting an angiogram done. The angiogram showed the right common iliac and external iliac arteries had minimal changes without stenosis. Internal iliac artery was patent. Um, he had a wide open femoral. The popliteal was patent with mild atherosclerotic changes. The PT and peritoneal extending to the ankle. There's some narrowing, and they were able to open those up. So, as a result, after the patient had his procedure, so he was revascularized. Then we went ahead and focused on wound management. So. For this patient, uh, wound management included the use of a uh, topical chromogram prisma matrix, um, the carousel AD gelling fiber, and then foam borders, along with offloading with a cam boot. So the other thing that's very important in patients with diabetes is making sure that you're offloading the area or offloading pressure to the area. This can be accomplished with either a total contact cast or a cam boot walker. 
um, or some different orthotics that are available on the market. For this patient, you can see he kind of, his wound was a little bit more slough covered. Um, it was a little more slimy. So that's why we started originally with the carousel AG gelling fiber. And if you're not familiar with that, it is a dressing that has oxy salts in it. So when the oxy salts um, are activated, what happens is they release a derivative of hydrogen peroxide into the wound bed, which helps bring more oxygen to the tissues and helps break up that slough. So once we got all of that slough cleaned out, we got the wound looking a lot better. We weren't concerned about um, any bio burden or infection. At that time, we did transition him to the Promogram Prisma in just a foam type dressing. So in conclusion, diabetes can impact healing and wounds. We know that it's very important for tight glycemic control in these patients. Uh, we know that patients with diabetes can be unique in their foot structure. Many times these patients will have uh, changes either due to previous amputations. They might have uh, changes due to something peripheral neuropathy resulting in a Charcot joint where the uh, arch of the foot starts to drop. They may have the development of uh, bunions. They can have... Um, just different changes that will impact the, their gait. It will impact how they walk. It'll impact the pressure areas on their foot. So just making sure that you're aware of that in your assessments. And then diabetic patients are at high risk for the development of life and limb threatening amputations. Uh, patients with diabetes are at high risk for the development of infections that can lead to limb and life-threatening amputations. Um, so it's very important to tell your patients with diabetes to do regular foot exams to make sure that they're letting their doctor know right away if they notice anything different. And then diabetic patients can have that micro and macrovascular compromise. So making sure when you're seeing these patients that you're doing a really good job of doing a thorough uh, vascular exam as well as the uh, physical exam of the foot and ulcer. Remembering that um, just because you do an ABI and it says that the vessels are non-compressible or they might be falsely elevated, that means they're non-compressible also to go on and get an arterial duplex, which will show us more of um, which diseases or which vessels are uh, compromised. And then just remembering when you're treating these people also that the gold standard is offloading. So making sure that you have them in some type of offloading device, whether it's a total contact cast or a um, cam boot or orthotic. And then remembering that once these patients do develop an ulceration, that you're treating it with uh, topical wound therapy that promotes a moist wound healing environment that prevents infection or treats infection or biofilm that may be present. And then making sure that you're protecting the peri wound skin from maceration. These ulcerations are really at high risk for um, being really wet and soggy. So you wanna make sure that you're keeping the area as dry as possible. And um, the patient is understanding of the care plan and that everybody is on board with that. So thank you for your time.